Hi, and welcome to Passion for Truth Ministries. I'm Jim Staley. Today, we have an exciting subject. I get an, an enormous amount of emails and a lot of phone calls, and people have been asking me to do this teaching for six years now plus. Uh, so every year, I say I'm going to get around and do this teaching, but this is the year to teach on the Sabbath. So for whatever reason, the Lord is having me do this, and I'm excited about it. We're going to work through a lot of scriptures. We're going to determine at the end of this study what the Sabbath is, what it means for us today, and how do we keep it if we're supposed to keep it. So let's get started today uh, talking about the Sabbath and work through the scriptures and see what they have to say. First of all, there are several questions that we'll need to answer. Number one is, does God even care? Does he care about the Sabbath whatsoever? Number two, who is it given to? Number three, why was it given and how long was it to be given for? We'll also be talking about several myths about the Sabbath. Number one, uh, what is the prophetic symbolism? We'll also be talking about that. Why don't we keep the Sabbath of the Bible today, and was it really changed? And then if it is for today, how do we keep it? I know that many of you will be thinking to yourself, uh, you already have, some of you Bible students already have verses in your head in the New Testament that you're familiar with that seem to say that the Sabbath is done away with, that we don't have to keep it, that it's not relevant for today, that it was only for uh, the Old Testament or for the, the, the New Testament Jews. So I want to bring these up right away so you know that we're actually going to cover every single one of those. So if we could go back to the screen, one of the ones we're going to cover is Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. says, let no one judge you for food or drink, new moons or Sabbath. We're going to talk about that. Romans 14, 6 we'll talk about. Whoever observes the day, observes it for the Lord. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 we'll talk about where Paul takes up a collection for the saints in Jerusalem on the first day of the week. And in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, where Paul's preaching on the first day of the week. A couple other ones we'll be talking about is Revelation 1.10, when John had a vision on, quote, the Lord's Day. We'll find out exactly what the Lord's Day is, and is it referring to Sunday? And then also, lastly, Galatians 4, where Paul talks about not going back to the elementary principles of the world. So what we want to talk about is we're going to find out, first of all, does God even care about the Sabbath whatsoever? So before we can go any further, it's, it's a relevant question to answer. Because if he doesn't care, if the creator of the universe, Yahweh, does not care about the Sabbath, then we don't need to go any further in our study. So we're going to determine that right up front. He says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, he says, For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth. And every time you see L-O-R-D in capital letters in your Bible, that is the actual tetragrammaton or the Hebrew proper name for Yahweh, yod heh vav -Heh. So you'll hear me say Yahweh whenever, I, uh, whenever we read L-O-R-D because that's what it actually says in the Hebrew. For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, the sea and all that's in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore Yahweh blessed the seventh day, or the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. So one of the very first things that we're going to be talking about, if he says, to answer the question, does he care, is right here in Exodus, we find that he gives a commandment. So it's really almost a silly question, although we're going to work through it, we're going to get the answer to it, to ask the question, does he care about something that he said is a commandment, is like me telling one of my five daughters uh, to clean your room on Thursday night, and have them ask, well, does God, does, does Daddy really even care if we clean it at all? And so I, I want to propose and submit that to you, that really even asking the question is really a strange question because he's the potter, we are the clay, 
if he says uh, to do something, then we should do it and not ask why or if, we should, if he really meant it. Because ultimately, isn't that what the enemy said in the garden? The serpent said, he didn't really mean. He didn't really mean for you to do that. You won't really die. There's always asking the question. Uh, but for the sake of argument, we're going to work through this. Back to the beginning. Acts chapter 3, verse 20 says this, and, they, and that he may send Yeshua the Messiah, who is, what's his Hebrew name is Yeshua, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. And at what point on the timeline do you think he'll be restoring all things? Because listen, we have a, a very Greek mentality. We have a timeline that starts over here and ends over here. And so when we have to ask the question, we come to Acts chapter 3, verse 20, when it says that at the end of time, he's going to restore all things. Well, at what point on this timeline is he going to restore all things? Is it going to be in, 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 in the 21st century, sometime in the 21st century, sometime in the 20th century? Is he going to restore it to the times of the first century? Or is he going to restore it all the way back to when he said it was very good? Let's keep asking some serious questions here. Number one, can we agree that when our creator made the heavens and the earth, that there were no flaws and that he made all things perfect? Number two, can we agree that everything that he made in the garden was perfect and he never intended or desired for anything to change for all eternity? And number three, would you agree with me that if Adam had not sinned, everything that was said to be very good would still be perfect and unchanged. Number four, would you agree with me that in the beginning, all things were perfect, as we just established? Then Adam sinned, sent the world into a tailspin of constant groaning and imperfection. It says the whole world is groaning. But at some point in the future, when the Messiah comes back, he will restore all things back to the original state of perfection. And so we are going to answer these very serious questions because ultimately uh, you, we all deserve that these questions that, to be asked and for every single one of them to be answered. If we move to Genesis chapter 2, we're going to find out that the motivation of God, the motivation of Yahweh is everything. On the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. He rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. And this is Genesis chapter 2. So in the, not even into the, two verses into the second chapter of the Bible, we are talking about a verse that is setting something apart. Matter of fact, the Hebrew word for, uh, for uh, set apart is kadosh. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. So if he set apart the seventh day in the garden when everything was said to be perfect, and it was never his intention for anything to ever change from that perfection, and the scriptures tell us that he is going to restore all things back to the beginning, think about this. Isn't it logical to assume that the Sabbath on the seventh day was never intended to change? It was never intended to change. If he created Adam and Eve perfect, and he created the earth perfect, and all the animals perfect, and he created the sun, the moon, the stars, and the heavens perfect, and when he finished everything and rested on the seventh day, and he said, I hollow it, I set it apart, I make it completely different than all the rest of the days, I am making it holy, just like he sets us apart and makes us holy from the rest of the world. We're not like the rest of the world. We are set apart, the same exact word that's used in Genesis 2-2, we as believers are that exact same word. We are consecrated and dedicated, sanctified and set apart. And that's what he's doing all the way back in the garden. So the point is this. If he sets it apart in the garden before they sinned, then isn't it very logical to assume that Yahweh's entire intent and desire is for it to never, ever have changed? Let's go back to res the restoration of the Sabbath when Yeshua comes back. I mean, let's find out if this is true. If it's true in the garden, it has to be true for all time. In Isaiah 66, 22, it says this, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says Yahweh, so shall your seed and your name remain. 
In verse 23, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, says Yahweh. Now, the reason why this is so critical of a verse in Isaiah 66 is because this is when the Messiah is coming back. This is literally in the messianic reign. This is the thousand-year millennial reign of the Messiah. And during the millennial reign of the Messiah, he says right here that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh will worship him. So the question is begging, why would he even mention the word Sabbath or Shabbat uh, in Hebrew here if there is no intention of the Sabbath being set apart or being holy? Zechariah 14 verse 16 says this, And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left on the nations, now setting this up, setting this up here real quick before we go back to it, is that Yeshua has just landed on the Mount of Olives, split it in two, okay? So we are literally at the, 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 the day of trumpets, the, the fall festivals where the Messiah comes back, he lands on the Mount of Olives, and he is beginning his millennial reign in Jerusalem. That's where Zechariah 14 is picking up. Verse 16, it says this, And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, Yeshua, Yahweh of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Keeping the Feast of Tabernacles in the millennium as well. And it shall be that who, whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, Yahweh of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. So we are seeing uh, not only in Isaiah that we are going to be keeping the, 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 the Shabbat, which are called the Shabbat or the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath. But right here in the millennium in Zechariah 14, we have a more than a hint, more than a clue. We have a direct command that all of the nations of the world must come up for the Feast of Tabernacles and they must honor the Lord's Sabbath. And this is, this is the, 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 uh, the importance of this is because we see this in the garden, and the logic says that he never intended for it to go away to begin with. We see this in the, in the end. We see this in the millennium, which goes on for a thousand years. The only question of time that we're asking about is right now, in between those two moments of time, and that's what we're going to find out today by searching the scriptures. Because ultimately, this is what we have. If we believe that the Sabbath is not for today, then we have this strange paradox, because from 4,000 B.C. to the time of Yeshua, Yahweh cares. God cares. Then from 30 A.D. to the present day, he doesn't care. And then when Yeshua comes back for the next thousand years, he cares again. So he cares, he doesn't care, and now he cares again. And so we have to determine, is this logical? Is this a logical God that says, I don't change I will never change. I'm a God who is a jealous God. I want you to worship me and do it my way, and I want you to use faith, and I will give you the faith as I send my spirit to help you. But is it logical for him to make a law, says it's eternal, repeal it, and then bring it back? Or could it possibly be that we've misunderstood this part? Let's see. Bottom line is this. He cared in the garden. He cares when his son comes back. He says that the seventh-day Sabbath is forever. It's logical to assume that he still cares. But we're going to test this theory and find out if it actually holds water in the next 30, 40 minutes. So some common myths about the Sabbath. Number one, one of the most common myths by far that people email me or they'll talk to me about is, Jim, the Sabbath was given only to the Jews. We'll talk about that. They also say that the, it's the Christian Sabbath is on Sunday. The Jewish Sabbath is on Saturday. I just had someone last week, even in my own family, that said, Jim, the, the Sabbath, the Jewish Sabbath is on Saturday, but the Christian Sabbath is on Sunday. Well, we have a major scriptural problem with that because that's two laws, one for the Jew, one for the Gentile, when we don't have time to go into it. But in Deuteronomy, it says that I will have one law for the Jew and the Gentile. One people, one law, one God, one Messiah, one land. Number three, most common myths about the Sabbath is it ended at the cross and was not reestablished in the New Testament. Number four, Paul taught against the Sabbath. 
we're going to find out whether that's true or not as well. And also the New Testament church kept the Sabbath on Sunday. And that is uh, very, very common. So let's start off with myth number one. It was only given to the Jews. First of all, we need to determine where did the term Jew even come from? Well, it's very important uh, to understand this before we go any further, because this is probably by far one of the biggest misconceptions of the entire Bible, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it a little bit later, is that there is, a, there is the Old Testament, which is for the Jews, and the New Testament is for the Christians. Well, it's very important to remember that the word Jew comes from the term Judah, which is the tribe of Judah. And it's also not only the tribe of Judah, but it's also the southern kingdom. You have the northern kingdom, which was called the house of Israel, and the southern kingdom, which was called the house of Judah. Over time, eventually, the house of Judah became, became, became known as, excuse me, the Jews. And so that's why we have Jews today, is because the Jews came back from captivity in 70, uh, excuse me, for 70 years in Babylon back in 586 B.C., where the northern kingdom never came back. They assimilated into the nation. So today, the word Jew can be in Israel, but Israel of the Bible is all 12 tribes. So a matter of fact, in that uh, line of thinking, how many tribes of Israel were present at the base of Mount Sinai when the commandments were given? This is really important, because if, if we say that the Sabbath was only given to the Jews, then what we're saying is that the only tribe... The only kingdom that was at the base of Mount Sinai was the house of Judah, or Judah themselves. There have to be no other tribes at the base of Mount Sinai if it was only given to the Jews, because that's what the term Jew means, okay? There were 12 tribes at the base of Mount Sinai. All 12 of them were there. So clearly, he did not give it only to the Jews. He gave it to all of the sons of Jacob, Yaakov, or Israel. And that's the biblical answer to who did he actually give it to. He gave it to all the sons of Israel. The third question that we need to ask is this. How many would end up being considered Jewish? And we just answered this, that there was the southern kingdom that ended up being Jewish, which ended up being comprised of Judah, Benjamin, and a little bit of Levi. So that, if you were in the southern kingdom, eventually you became Judah or Jewish. All the rest of them were from the northern kingdom, Asher, Dan, Naphtali, uh, all of those uh, are not Jewish. So if you're from the northern, if, if there were such thing as a Danite today, they would be called a Danite. They would not be called Jewish. Even if they kept the Sabbath, all the feast days, and the entire Torah, they could not be called Jewish because they're not from the southern kingdom. They were from the northern kingdom. If anything, they'd be called a Ephraimite or, a, uh, uh, or an Israelite, a Hebrew. That, that would be probably a more biblical accurate uh, explanation of those that are from the northern kingdom. And so what was the purpose of Israel? Isaiah 42, 6. This is really important. I, Yahweh, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people as a light to the Gentiles. Does that sound familiar? Because in Matthew chapter 5, it's, Yeshua says the very same thing. He says, I am the light to the, to the nations. And then he turns to his, his disciples and he says, now you are the light to the world. You see, that wasn't just a brilliant stroke of genius that he came up with. He's literally keeping the same message that he had from the very beginning of time all the way till the time where he gives these instructions, it's the same instructions that his father gave Israel to begin with, is that I want you to be a light to the nations. Now think about this for just a moment. If Israel is a light, that means that there are people in darkness. And so what happens if people are in darkness and they can't see, and you see a light? Picture yourself in your dark bedroom, and you get up in the middle of the night. What is normally the very first thing that you're going to gravitate towards so that you can not bump into the walls, you're going to find the first light. Your, your, your eyes are going to be attracted and gravitate towards light because where there is light, you can see. And so that is the whole illustration that, that God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is trying to get across to his people is that I have given you the truth, which is my light, which David says many times in the Psalms and throughout the scriptures that his truth is light, and a light uh, unto my path, right? And he says, they are in darkness. I want you to take my truth 
keep it so that I can bless you so that they will be attracted to the light and then they can join you. And that was the whole concept in Exodus when the Israelites left Egypt and some of the mixed multitude came from the Egyptians, some of the smart Egyptians uh, defected from the army uh, and they, they said, you know what, uh, their God's a little bigger than our God, I think I'll follow uh, their God. And they defected and they came with the Israelites and Moses said, uh, came to Yahweh and said, what are we going to do here? They're not native born, what, what, what should we do? And Yahweh said, absolutely allow them in. This is the first time we see grafted in happening in the Bible that we come to later in Romans chapter 11, where he says, let them be grafted in and let them be as native born Israelites. The only thing I'm going to require of them is this, and it's the same thing, by the way, in Acts chapter 15, which we'll address a little bit later, same halakhic decision. He says, have them be circumcised and have them keep my commandments, and they will be no different than any of my children, okay? And so that's really important for us to understand right up front that the purpose of Israel was to be a light to the nations. Unfortunately, they didn't do their job. So the father had to send his son down here to teach us how to do our job. Deuteronomy chapter 4 says, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all these decrees and say, surely this nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way Yahweh our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I'm setting before you this day? So think about this. We have the Great Commission idea in Christianity where we, we spend millions of dollars and we go out and we tell everybody about Jesus and you've got to do this and you've got to do that. And we try our best with most creative ways of audio, visual, and, and pamphlets, and, you know, little tracks, and videos, and all of these things to try to get people to see the gospel, to try to make it the most attractive thing possible. But the very first great commission was this. It was, keep my commandments, and I will bless you so much that the nations will come to you. You won't have to go to them because they will see that they're in the dark, that they're not being blessed, that you're the ones that have rain on your land, that you're the ones that are, 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 are not hungry, that you're the ones that are being blessed in every way known to man, and they're going to come and find out that you, what an incredible God that you have that has such amazing and marvelous decrees and statutes. Tell us about your God. Now, wouldn't it be nice if you had people knocking on your door asking you, tell us, how are you doing it? How are you so blessed? Why are you so happy? Why are your marriage... And so happy. Why are your kids so good? And you have the opportunity to tell them. See, I'm going to suggest to you that one of the biggest problems that we have in religious Christian circles today is that there's not enough meat on the bones. There's not enough of a growth in the garden, if you will. There's not enough life coming out of the life for that people can see the life and desire it. We have so many things that we offer them, and they see right through it, and they see dead bones. They see walking dead people, if you will. And I believe the Father wants to resurrect the bones and put the flesh and the sinews back on so that we can absolutely have life flowing out of us like a river that brings uh, life to the nations. This is an interesting slide. Gentiles encouraged to keep the Sabbath in the Old Testament? This is one of the number one scriptures that people bring up, or number one concepts that pre people bring up, and they say, Jim, nowhere in the Bible does God tell Gentiles that they have to keep the Sabbath. And I say, really? Isaiah 56, let's see what it says. Also the sons of the stranger, Goyim, the Gentiles, and the sons of the, of the Gentiles that join themselves to the Lord, to serve him and to love the name of Yahweh, to be his servants, everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all 
the nations. Do you hear what the, the, the great God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is saying right here? He is saying that even the Gentiles, if they come, if is the key word, I-F, if they come and they keep my Sabbath and they keep from profaning it, I will accept them as my own people. And the key word there is if. Two important things he's saying in the scripture. First of all, he allows the Gentiles to come in and be his people. Number two, he puts a condition on it. You will be my people if you do what I tell you to do. It's no different than a father that tells his son that's 17 years old, that's kind of talking back, and he says, son, if you want to live in this house, you can finish the rest of it. You're going to play by my rules. You see, it works on earth. It works in every workplace. You can't just walk into a workplace and look at the rules as they train you on your first day and say, you know what, I'm going to choose this rule, but I don't really like this rule. I think I'm, I'm going to leave at 3 o'clock instead of 5.30. It doesn't work like that, or you don't stay very long. And I'm going to suggest that we have turned God from Creator Yahweh into our friend and buddy where we have the choice to choose to serve Him when and how we want. Let's continue. We have one law for both. Exodus 12, 49 says this, one law, one law shall be for him that is homeborn and unto the stranger that sojourns among you. So there's one law for us and there's the same law for the Jews. The same law for all of Israel. See, doesn't that make a lot more sense that he has one law for one people, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberties and so on and so forth, in one land? Under one king, it's all about one. The second you split it, we have issues. So the, here's the game plan. I, this is an illustration that I give a, a, quite a bit because I think it, it seems to help people understand what the purpose of Israel was. Think of Israel as a football team. And they are the captains of the team. So Yahweh wanted to get a team together because all of the teams went their own way and they didn't want to play in his stadium anymore. So finally, he had to choose someone to get back into the stadium so that he could begin to bring the people back in one place because they're all their own stadiums, and he wants them in his stadium and to play on his field. So he chose the Israelites to be the captains of the team. Their job was to do this. Their job was to do what the owner of the team told them to do, to practice the way that the owner told them to practice and to play the way that the owner told them to play. And if they did that, this would result in the team being so blessed that all of the other players from all the other teams would quit their teams, stop playing in their stadiums, which he didn't build, and they would come back to Yahweh's stadium. They would play on his team. They would beg to be on his team. Their light, quote, was supposed to show them the way. The light coming out of the stadiums would be so amazing that they would say, man, we don't even have light in our stadium. We can only play during the day. And they would come and be able to play on his turf, his way, and be blessed by his rules. Bottom line, the Sabbath was given to the whole world in Genesis chapter 2 when everything was perfect and when clearly it was intended to be for all time. It was written down on Mount Sinai and given to all of the children of Israel, not just one, but all 12 tribes with the intent for them to keep it and thus be a light for the nations. And it's not a Jewish Sabbath. So dispelling myth number one, very clearly, it is not a Jewish Sabbath. It says that it is the Sabbath of Yahweh. So if it was given to the Israelites and through them the nations, then the next logical question is, who are we? If it was given to the Israelites and not to the Jews... You might say, well, Jim, I'm a Gentile. I, I'm, I, I'm not an Israelite at all. I'm not a Jew, and I'm not from any uh, Middle Eastern descent or so on. I, I'm, I'm just an American Christian. How does this relate to me? Well, let's find out. In Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 16, one of the most popular chapters in all of the New Testament, it says this. It says, The Yahweh called thy name a green olive tree, fair and of goodly fruit. So right here, in Jeremiah chapter 11, and this is a, a verse that is not very well known. Now, the one that I was talking about was Romans 11, which is very popular. But Romans 11 is attached to Jeremiah 11. You cannot get into Romans 11 without first understanding 
what's happening in Jeremiah 11 is that Yahweh calls his bride, his people, the chosen people, an olive tree. Very critical if we're going to understand who we are and how this all relates to the Sabbath. Ephesians chapter 2 says, Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, the Messiah, excluded from citizenship in Israel. Excluded, meaning they are not allowed to be part of Israel. And foreigners or Gentiles to the covenants of the promise. Covenants with an S, by the way. Without hope and without God in the world. But now in Yeshua the Messiah, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. So you, you hear what, what's happening here is, first of all, he says that you once were far off. You were not allowed to be a citizen of Israel. You could not even be part of her covenants. Do you realize that the writer of Ephesians is putting value in the covenants of promise? Because he's saying that you were not allowed to have this blessing. You were not even allowed to be a part of it. But let's keep reading. He says, therefore, going back to Exodus 31, it says, therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and he was refreshed. So think about it this way. First of all, Jeremiah 11 says that Israel is an olive tree. Ephesians 2 says, You who were once far off have now been brought near, and you've been made fellow citizens with the household of God. Romans 11 talks about being grafted in. It says what? There's two olive trees, okay? Two olive trees, and the wild olive tree gets grafted back into the cultivated olive tree, and let's substitute the correct word in Jeremiah 11. It gets cultivated back into Israel. So these Gentiles actually are no longer Gentiles. Do you realize, viewer, that, that the word Gentile means out of covenant? So if you consider yourself a Gentile Christian, what you're really saying is you're an out-of-covenant Christian, and that's an oxymoron. You can't have that. Uh, either you are in covenant, and you're part of the Messiah, or you're out of covenant, and you will spend eternity away from him. So what we're having here is that Paul has, is not having a brilliant stroke of genius. He is literally quoting the Old Testament, and he is saying, listen, all of those who were sent to the four corners of the earth, you are now allowed to come back home. The Gentiles are allowed to be part of Israel. That's why he says, you are now fellow citizens of Israel. You are Israelite heritage, and you now have access to the covenants. He doesn't say covenant as if there's only one covenant called the New Covenant. Middle Eastern covenants layer on one another. In Greek, in our Western Christian mindset, we think, Old is done away, new is new. We cannot combine the two. We don't understand how Middle Eastern covenants work. They are transparencies that reveal they never go away. They simply reveal a bigger part of the picture. This is critical to understand that you become a citizen of Israel and become subject to her covenants of promise. Ladies and gentlemen, you are Israel. You are not a, 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 a Baptist, a Methodist. There's no Lutheran line uh, or, or non-denominational line on Judgment Day at the resurrection. Either there is a line for Israelites, the chosen people, or there's a line for Gentiles, pagans, those that do not know Yeshua as Messiah. There is, it doesn't even matter if you have Jewish blood. Either you are part of Israel, and you believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you are following Yeshua the Messiah, or you do not, you see. That's why Paul says that it doesn't matter if you're even born a Jew. It matters if you are a Jew in your heart, if you are truly following him through obedience in the Messiah. And why is this so critical to understand? Why did I just go through all of that to, to determine who's Israel? Because if you recognize who you are, that you are Israel, then it makes way more sense and it's more relevant to continue our study uh, today because the Sabbath was given to Israel. And it says it was given for all eternity. So now we have dis, uh, completely dispelled myth number two that it was only given to the Jews because it wasn't. It was given to all Israel. Now we understand that it was given to anyone who is calling themselves a child of God, which is anyone that believes in the Messiah, you are grafted in, according to Romans chapter 11. 
Jeremiah 31, 31. This is the new covenant chapter of all the Bible. It says this. It says, Behold, the days come, says Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now think about this for a moment. I want to ask you a question for all of you viewers out there that believe that, 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 that God made a covenant with the Gentile Christians. Can you please show me in Jeremiah chapter 31 where it says that he is going to make a covenant with the Gentiles? Never. It doesn't say it one single time. Not even in the New Testament does it say that there is going to be a covenant with the Gentiles. There is one people of God, ladies and gentlemen, and it is the house of Israel, the northern kingdom, and it is the house of Israel, the southern kingdom, which split under King Solomon, which at some point he will bring back and make all Israel one again. And he says that he is going to make a new covenant with one people, and he calls them the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So you must be one of those two kingdoms, or you cannot be in the new covenant. The new covenant is completely illegitimate. It's a moot point for you. If you do not consider yourself Israel, then you have no covenant. There is no new covenant, and there is no blood shed for your sins, and you, are st you will die in your sins uh, on judgment day. Myth number two, the Christian Sabbath is Sunday. Well, let's walk right into this. The Roman Emperor Constantine said this about Sunday. On March 7th, 321 AD, he passed his famous national Sunday law, and I quote, let all judges and townspeople and occupations of all trades rest on the venerable day of the sun. I could literally go on for several more slides quoting, uh, uh, quoting uh, Constantine. He says in other places that if anybody is caught resting on what he calls the Jewish Sabbath, see how it got messed up all the way back then because he's a Gentile and he hated the Jews, that if anyone's caught resting on the Jewish Sabbath, which was Saturday or the seventh day, they would be excommunicated from the church or killed if they didn't stop. The Catholics completely admit the change. Of course, these two old quotations are uh, exactly correct. By the way, this is coming from This Rock. The magazine of Catholic Apologetics in 1997 says this. Of course, these two old quotations are exactly correct. The Catholic Church designated Sunday as the day for corporate worship and gets full credit or blame for that change. They also says this. Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did, the Catholic church that is, happened in the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday. The day of the Lord was chosen, not from any directions noted in the scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own power. Right here, we are seeing quotes from the Catholic church admitting that they changed the day. Let's continue. Another one, this is from the Centennial Pastors Page, St. Catherine Catholic Church in Michigan in 1995, says this, the day of resurrection, the day of Pentecost, 50 days later, came on the first day of the week. So this would be the new Sabbath. People who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventist and keep Saturday holy. They are admitting, and they go on to say, that anyone that keeps Anyone that calls Sunday, the first day of the week, the Sabbath, actually falls under the jurisdiction of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. So we see right here that they even admit that the only logical people that are consistent with the Sabbath, if you're going to be uh, called a Sabbatarian, uh, they say that you should be a Seventh-day Adventist. Now, I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist. I'm not advocating that you become a Seventh-day Adventist, but I am advocating that we look heavily into the Scriptures and uncover uh, th these, these w somebody put drapes over the windows when the light is supposed to be coming in. We need to open it back up and, and find out what's been concealed this whole time. Did they really change the Sabbath and turn it into Sunday when it used to be on Saturday? Do we have any evidence that Christians or early believers in Yeshua kept the Sabbath on the biblical day that's commanded on Saturday. And also one more quote says, the Roman Catholic Church changed the observance of the Sabbath to Sunday by right of the divine infallible authority given to her by founder Yeshua or Jesus Christ. The Protestant claiming that the Bible to be the only guide of faith has no warrant for observing Sunday. In this matter, the Seventh-day Adventist is the only consistent Protestant. 
Now, I would disagree with that because there are a lot of us out there that believe in the Saturday Sabbath, but that happens to be one of the most popular uh, denominations that are out there. Look at this. One of the most incredible quotes of all time that I have ever found on this subject is from Socrates Scalacticus in the 5th century, says this. He's a church historian. For although almost all churches throughout, did you hear that? All churches throughout the world celebrate the sacred mysteries of the Lord's Supper on the Sabbath every week. Yet the Christians of Alexandria and at Rome, on account of some ancient tradition, have ceased to do this. And another historian confirming this states, the people of Constantinople and almost everywhere assembled together on the Sabbath as well as on the first day of the week, which custom is never observed at Rome or at Alexandria. Did you hear what I just said, ladies and gentlemen? What these, what these historians are saying is that believers everywhere kept the Sabbath on the seventh day. They met that Saturday night late into the evening. That's what Paul was doing when Eutychus fell out the window and he healed him. They met on the first day of the week as well sometimes, but nobody in Rome or Alexandria did that. So let me ask you a question that will really drive home my point. Who ended up ruling the world? Rome. It was Rome that made all of the decrees for the rest of mankind, uh, the known world at that time. It was Rome that made these changes. And so that's where, why we do what we do today is because of the decrees and the changes of the laws that happened so long ago, and we literally have never turned around. We've never audited ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to audit what we believe because we are human. We're mere men, and you give us enough time and just a little bit off, one half of a degree, 2,000 years becomes hundreds of miles, and that's what we're trying to do here at Passion for Truth Ministries is we're trying to get back to the truth because the truth can only do one thing, and what is that? Set us free. Myth number three, Yeshua does not tell us to keep the Sabbath. Well, we're going to find out if that's really true. Does Jesus really tell us not to keep the Sabbath? Does he really break the Sabbath? Does his disciples break the Sabbath? Do they keep the Sabbath on the seventh day? And if, if so, how did they do it? So let's get started. We see this all over the place over the last 10 or 15 years. This has been really popular. WWJD. What would Jesus do? I remember even kids wearing bracelets with that. Uh, shirts that said, what would Jesus do? Posters, banners inside of churches. What would Jesus do? Well, let's ask the question. What would, we, what would Yeshua actually do? Matter of fact, let's go beyond that. What did he do? What did he do? John 14, 15 says this. If you love me, Keep my commandments. Yeshua is talking here. If you love me, keep my commandments. Matthew 23, 1 says, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So before I go any further, let, let's, let's talk about this. John 14, 15 says this. Yeshua is talking. He says, If you love me, you will do exactly what I tell you to do. You will keep my commandments. Now, the question is begging, which commandments? Well, let me ask you a question. If you believe that Jesus is God and he is the word made flesh that created all of the heavens and the earth, then he wrote them all, ladies and gentlemen. He is the word. He wrote all of them. He could not have wrote some and his father wrote some. He is the word. He is the Torah made flesh. He is the reason for the season, if you will. And he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now watch what the next commandment is very carefully. Matthew 23. Then Yeshua said to the crowds and to his disciples, which is you, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, called the Bema seat. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Well, when I was in Israel, and for those of you that have been there, you've been to some of the ancient synagogues, and what you'll notice is there is a, there is a stone seat. It's a stone bench, and it's called the Bema seat or the Moses' seat. And every Shabbat, 
one of the rabbis or one of the people that is part of the local assembly would read the Torah. That was the only thing that you were allowed to do when you sat in that seat was actually read. You were not allowed to commentate. You were not allowed to give your opinion. You were not allowed to preach. You were not allowed to add or take away from it. You literally only read the law and the prophets. When you stood up from that, you could commentate. You can argue. The rabbis would come together. They would give their opinion of it. That was fine. But when you're sitting in Moses' seat, you are only allowed to literally read the word of Yahweh. So what do we have here? We have first Yeshua saying, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments and you'll do what I tell you to do. And secondly, what does he tell his disciples to do? To listen and do every single thing the Pharisees tell you to do from that seat. Why? Because when they're sitting in that seat, they're not commentating. They're telling you exactly what my father told you to do 1,200 years earlier. They're speaking the Torah and the prophets. And Yeshua, in a very clear but indirect way, because most of us as believers do not grow up even knowing what Moses' seed is and the significance of it or what they did when they sat on it, but Yeshua is telling them very directly, I want you to do, hear and do the Torah. He's referring right back to the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6, hear and do. Hear the Lord our God is one. He is a chad. And you are to keep his commandments through faith and write them on your heart. He is making it very clear. And that's why I'm going over this over and over because I cannot stress the importance of this, that he's telling his disciples to do what the Pharisees say. And what do the Pharisees say? They quote the Torah. Matthew chapter 19, verse 16 says this, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to them, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to them, Which ones? Yeshua said, and he starts quoting the different ten, uh, ten Commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. You shall, not love, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So uh, here's what we have. we have. We have this rich man coming to Yeshua saying, Listen, I want eternal life. I can see clearly that you're a miraculous person. How do I enter into eternal life? And Yeshua says, Keep my commandments. He does not say, Hey, by the way, uh, if you'll just raise your hand, come down to the front and invite me into your heart, then you will have an eternal life. He doesn't say that. He's the, he says the very same thing that his father said 1,200 years, 4,000 years earlier, keep my commandments and you will live. If you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and you disobey me, you will die. It's the same message from Genesis all the way to Revelation. We just have to look at it the right way. And so the, the, the rich young ruler says, well, which one should I keep? Yeshua begins to walk through the commandments, and he interrupts him, and, and he says, man, I, I've kept all those. And Yeshua says, now go and sell everything that you own. And the young man walked away sad because he had many possessions. Why does he say that? Does he really intend for him to go sell everything? No. He is saying that the Father is only looking for one kind of worshiper, and is the worshiper that will worship in spirit and in truth. And that young man had the truth. He was keeping the truth, but he was not doing it through faith. And faith is what's required to make the truth come alive. His disciples honored the Sabbath after his death their entire lives. Jim, there's no way the disciples actually kept the Sabbath. Well, let's find out. In Luke 23, verse 56, it says this. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes. But they, This is right after Yeshua died. But they rested on Shabbat. They rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. So here you have Mary and Martha, some of the disciples of Yeshua. They followed Yeshua. And I'd imagine the rest of the disciples are doing the exact same thing. They, are, they had to get them into the ground because the next day was the Sabbath. Now that particular day uh, when, he, when he died, uh, the next day was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It was a high Sabbath. And then you had Friday in between there. They bought the spices on Friday. Then they had to rest for the weekly Sabbath. Now, why would they be resting if they're not obeying the Sabbath? They are literally, after the death, they are obeying the Sabbath. And I'm going to suggest as we move through here, and you see many more times where it's alluded to that they actually kept the Sabbath, that they did not get the memo 
that Yeshua sent them, saying the Sabbath was done away with, because there was none. 1 Corinthians 7.19 says this, Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping the commandments of God is what counts. Do you hear what Paul is saying here? Paul is saying that, listen, there, he's talking about salvation, and there's a big debate on whether you can be saved if you're circumcised. And this is the way that he would have said it, because this is the context. Circumcision means nothing. Uncircumcision means nothing. Both of you guys are wrong. Neither one of them are required for salvation. What really matters is keeping the commandments of Yahweh through faith. The same message that Yeshua gave, the same message that Yahweh gave on Mount Sinai, and the same message that he gave to Adam in the garden. Continuity, God never changes. He always remains the same. Paul says in Romans 3.31, Do we then nullify the law by this faith, the faith of Yeshua? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. So we have Paul in Romans chapter 3, verse 31, telling us that he upholds the law. Let me ask a, a, a question, maybe even a bit of a sarcastic question, is would anyone remotely insinuate that when he says that he upholded the law, that he is not referring to the Sabbath as being part of that law when it's the top five, number four on the charts, if you will? Of course, he is certainly, uh, in the back of his mind, the Sabbath being the most staple of all laws in the first century in Judaism would certainly be what he's talking about. He would not be saying that I'm going to upheld the law, but I'm going to break the Sabbath, and he would not be upholding the law. Peter in Acts chapter 10, this is an interesting one. Peter in Acts chapter 10, remember this is where the four corner sheet comes down and, and, and God tells him, arise Peter, kill and eat. And what's the very first thing out of Peter's mouth? He says, I, I can't do that. These are unclean animals. I, I have never had anything unclean touch my lips. Now we fly right on past there, but look at the significance of this. This is at least 10 years after the death of Yeshua the Messiah. Ten years. And Peter still has not eaten one single ham sandwich or pork chop. I find this incredibly significant. Because if he didn't get the memo on the dietary laws, and he's still keeping the dietary laws, isn't it a safe assumption that the dietary laws, who don't even make the top ten, that he certainly... Peter is keeping the Sabbath every single week. It would make no sense that he's not eating unclean animals, but he's breaking the Sabbath? Of course not. He is definitely keeping the rest of the law uh, because we're seeing an example of that right here. And so this is a very, a very big proof, to be quite honest with you, that Peter is not breaking the law, and we're talking a decade after the Messiah died. Certainly, if there was some doing away with, out of all the time they spent with Yeshua, don't you think that they would have had some inclination that he would be doing away with something and they, they could now do different things that they wanted to do? They didn't get that inclination because there was no inclination from the Messiah. In the book of Revelation, it's a, Apostle John in the book of Revelation says that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. So the question is, John is said to be the most Jewish of all the disciples. Now look, there's only two days in all of the Bible that are called the Lord's Day. And that is the Sabbath and the day that the Messiah comes back to judge the, na the nations. You see, one of the things that we have to remember when the New Testament was being written, when they were writing these, there was no New Testament. There was no canonization of the New Testament. Most of it didn't get written for 60 years. 40 to 60 years after the Messiah died, that these letters start to circulate and become canonized. And even some of them, 100 years after that. And so when Timothy is writing, he says, all scripture is God and worthy for reproof and doctrine and correction in the way of righteousness. The only scripture that he's referring to is the Torah and the prophets, the Old Testament. It's the only scripture that exists. And what I call them in our ministries, I call them the dictionary. It's the only dictionary that they had. So when John, the most Jewish of all the disciples, says the Lord's day, he is talking, he can only be using the definition that he's used to. And the only time the word Lord's day or day of the Lord is used in all of the Hebrew scriptures is talking about the Sabbath and when the Messiah comes back, the day of the Lord. And don't you find it interesting that 
the day that he says this in Revelation, when he says he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, the very next uh, thought that comes out of that chapter is that he hears a voice at the sound of a trumpet and the Messiah is coming back on the Feast of Trumpets, which is called the Lord's Day. I don't think it's coincidence. I think it is very likely that either it's on, on the seventh day, the Saturday, that he is uh, on the Lord's Day, or that he's actually been transported to the day of the Lord when the Messiah comes back. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 2, it says, it's By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. So we see the same exact message again. In Genesis, don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and light. If you love me, you'll do that law. It's, he, he says he chose Abraham because he kept the decrees, the ordinances, the commandments, and the instructions long before they were ever written down. Yeshua says the same thing. He says, if you want to enter eternal life, keep my commandments. John says that if you love Yahweh, you will keep his commandments. It's the only way to prove that you do love him is if you keep his commandments. As a matter of fact, he even goes beyond that into the 21st century, into our thought process. And he says, by the way, you American Christians, that I, that I know you're going to be there someday, his commandments are not burdensome. Don't let anybody lie to you. They're not burdensome. You've just never taught them. You've been taught that they're grievous, but if you keep them through faith, they will bless the socks off of you, and that they have done for me for sure. If we're able to believe most of Christianity that we don't have to keep the Sabbath of the Bible because it's not specifically recommanded in the New Testament, then how do we interpret John here when he says to keep the commandments of Yahweh when there's no New Testament at the time to look through? Ladies and gentlemen, I am here to suggest to you that, we, that the commandments of the first century are the same commandments of the very first century when Yahweh started out, and they're the same very commandments here today, that we need to take a look at these things and make sure that whatever commandments we're keeping, that that's where our love is. Are we keeping the commandments and the doctrines of men? Are we doing things just because of tradition? Or are we doing things because that's what the Bible said to do? So let's keep going. Saints, keep the Sabbath. In Revelation 14, 12, it says this, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of Yahweh and hold to the testimony of Yeshua. This is really important because really what, we're, what he's saying here is he's saying that those that are in the book of Revelation, the great tribulation, the beast aft, actually goes after those who keep the commandments of Yahweh and hold to the testimony of Yeshua. Not just those that believe in Jesus, but those who keep the commandments. Why? Because we've already determined that that's how we show that we love him. True love is doing what your father asks you to do. And I would even submit, based on my upbringing, the first time. The commandments of God clearly include the fourth commandment of honoring the Sabbath on the seventh day. Now, let's get into what I know everyone's favorite part is, what you've been waiting for this entire time, is, Jim, what about Romans chapter 14, 5? Well, let's work through some of these verses. 14, 5 says this, One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Is this what the author is saying? Is the author saying that literally, is Paul saying that, out of one stroke of his mouth, he says, I uphold the law, I keep the law. And Timothy says it's perfect and it's good and it's worthy for all doctrine. And then all of a sudden, Paul switches gears. Literally, 11 chapters later, he says, it, the Sabbath really doesn't matter. You can choose any day you want. Are we to really believe that Rabbi Shaul, who studied under, studied under Gamaliel, had the, most of the entire Old Testament memorized word for word, is telling us, as a Jewish former rabbi, that we can do whatever we want, we can choose whatever day we want? I suggest there's another meaning here, and we're reading into the text. Let's look. Verse 6 says, He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to Yahweh. Now, here's what's interesting is that if you look at this from a very careful point of view, you're going to see the very beginning of Romans chapter 14 is all about food, interestingly enough. 
It says to he who is, is, uh, is a strong believer, he decides that he can eat meat that's, str- that's offered to idols. And he who is weak in the faith only eats, eats vegetables because he's not sure if the meat uh, is coming from, uh, from, from, sacrifi- from the sacrificial system or not, from the pagans. So that, that whole context of food is carried down through Romans chapter 14, and we get to an interesting verse that I want you to read a different way. I want you to read it as if the entire context is exactly what it is, all about food. Let's read it again. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards that day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats, eats to the Lord. Now think about this. What I just said. He who considers one day special, let him do to the Lord. And, and he who eats which is saying that the one that says that this day is special is not eating. And a matter of fact, history bears this out. We know that there was a huge debate in the first century about fasting and which day to fast on. You had some groups that fasted on one day and another group that fasted on another day. And so in the midst of the topic of whether or not it's okay to eat animals that have been sacrificed to idols and how does that work out and play out when you go over to somebody's house to eat and you don't know where the meat came from, as long as it's clean. It's not saying that you can eat unclean animals. It's saying it's talking about a meat sacrificed to idols. In the same context of talking about food, does it not make sense that he would address fasting? And he says, listen, guys, you guys keep getting focused on, uh, you're making mountains out of mohills. If you think that Tuesday is okay to, uh, to fast, and you think it's Thursday, you each consider whatever day. The scriptures do not tell us which day to fast. So you eat meat on this day, you don't eat meat on this day, it's completely up to you. Certainly, Paul the Apostle is not advocating that anyone can choose any day that you want. And the proof of this is this, that this interpretation is correct, is that Paul would have been strung up by his heels if he was telling all of the people that you can break the Sabbath. They had already brought him and drug, drug him into the courts on false accusations earlier in Romans, and in Acts, and now we are led to believe that he, he is advocating clearly breaking the most staple law of all of Judaism, and no one even bats an eye. There's no debate. There's no first century uh, historians that are telling us that there was a huge debate or anything like that. No, there was no debate because that's not what Paul meant, and his, his uh, readers and his listeners knew that. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2. One of the most popular verses that people bring up to me says this, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of a new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Messiah. So he's telling us, do not let anybody judge you on these things. The question that is very important for us to ask is this, is he saying don't judge you, don't let them judge you for not keeping it? Or don't let them judge you for the way that you are keeping it. Both very valid questions. Let's find out what the context is going to suggest by backing up to verse 8, which gives it all away. Beware, before he gets to verse 16, he says in verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So right here, and matter of fact, he's going to say it again in verse 20. Since you died with Messiah to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belong to it, the world, do you submit to its rules, the world's rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with the use because they are based on human commands and teachings. They are based on human commands and teachings. So we are seeing that Paul is, is, is warning his converts in the book of Colossians that there's going to be a group of people that are going to come up to you and they're going to judge you and they're going to try to get you to do things their way using the traditions and the doctrines of men. If we interpret Colossians 2, 14 through 16 as saying that this group of people is trying to get Paul's converts to keep the Sabbath, we know for an absolute fact that the Sabbath is the fourth commandment from Yahweh. It is not a tradition or a doctrine of men. It is not philosophy. It is not vain deceit. It never does it say to worship angels or cut themselves as the rest of the chapter goes and and talks about. 
All of these laws that Paul is against are the extra traditions and the doctrines of men that they made up that he's against. Okay? So now, Colossians chapter 2, 16 is thrown out the window because now we realize that he is not talking about the biblical Sabbath. He's talking about them imposing the doctrines and traditions of men. Let's continue. It is much more likely that the Judaizers are judging the new converts for not keeping the Sabbath the way that they keep it. Do you remember, in the same context, he says, hey, I wish that they would, you know, and another, actually, I think it's, it's Galatians. He says, I wish they'd just go and emasculate themselves because all they're trying to do is put a notch on their belt. They're trying to say that these converts belong to us. They're our students. We're the rabbis. We've been around a lot longer. Paul's a maverick. We're up in council in Jerusalem. We are the circumcision party. We know what we're doing, and that's how they're beginning to become uh, a nuisance to Paul's. Every time he goes out of town, they're coming in town, and he's warning them, don't do things the way that they do them. Do them according to the commandment. Like Jesus said, do what they tell you to do from Moses to see, but don't do what they do. So while we're in Colossians chapter 2, let's, let's deal with this one verse because I know that people have really issues with, with a couple of verses here. It says, when you were dead in your sins, in verse 13, and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with the Messiah. He forgave us all our sins. That's critical. He's saying that he forgave us all of our sins. And then in the next verse, he says this, having canceled the written code, with its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us, he took it away nailing on the cross. I cannot tell you how many emails and people that believe that this verse, in one stroke of the pen, Paul is destroying and getting rid of all of the law of God. Just, just after he says that he upholds it, and he says that should we get rid of the law of God in, in Romans 6, may it never be, he can't speak out of both sides of his mouth. What is really happening here? The key is in verse 13 when it says that Yeshua forgave us of all sins. Remember, there's a curse from the law, and he is doing away with the curse. He is forgiving us of our sins, and that's why when he says in verse 14, have a canceled the written code, what's he talking about there? Well, let's read it in a different version, and I think you'll understand it a lot better. A better rendering is in the... the uh, uh, the ISV version, the International Standard Version, says this, having erased the charges that were brought against us with their decrees that were hostile to us. He took those charges away when he nailed them to the cross. Or the Lamza, or the Aramaic version, says this, and by his commandments, he canceled the written bond of our sins, which stood against us, and he took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Now, doesn't that make a lot more sense? Uh, viewer, if, is that he became the curse for us. Scripture tells us that. We broke the law. We deserve death, right? Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23. So all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We've all broken the commandments, and we all deserve death, and he became death for us. He did not do away with the law. He did away with the death or the curse. If he did away with the law, then we have a big problem because now there's no definition of sin, and there's no curse, and there's no need for a Savior, and how can Yahweh throw anyone into hell on Judgment Day at the end of the thousand-year millennial reign of the Messiah for breaking something that doesn't exist? So we're breaking all kinds of logic and hermeneutical rules there. Let's work through Acts chapter 20, verse 7 says this. Did the early church met on Sunday? Did they really meet on Sunday? Now, on the first day of the week, which in, in Greek it's sabbaton, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Now, here's the key behind Acts chapter 20, verse 7, is the phrase uh, does not say first day of the week. If you'll notice there, if you keep the slide up, it says that the, the word day is in italics. It is not in the original language. It actually says first of the sabbaton, or literal rendering, first of the Sabbaths. Now, that's a far difference uh, between the first uh, day of the week and the first of the Sabbaths. And what we find out is in the context of the verse right before that, is it says, after the days of unleavened bread. So we know we're in the days of unleavened bread, and without going into all the history... The day after the weekly Sabbath, okay, Yeshua dies. Three days later, he rises from the dead. That day is 
first fruits, the day after Saturday, which is the first day of the week, or what we call today on the Roman calendar, Sunday, that was what the scriptures call the first of the Shavuot, the first of the weeks. They had to count seven Shavuot or seven Sabbaths, and then they would come to the Feast of Pentecost, or in Hebrew, it's called the Feast of Shavuot. And right here in Acts chapter 20, what he's really saying is that this is the Feast of First Fruits. This is the first of the weeks that they count, the first of the Sabbaths. Now, the Greek translators clearly did not understand the feast days, or they would have instantly picked up on this, that it says right in the context, this is during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the first of the Sabbaths is that day. It is the day after the Sabbath, or the first day of the week, and that's exactly what the context is saying. Very important that we understand uh, the front of the Bible if we're going to understand the back of it. Let's move to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1. It says this, Now concerning the collection for the saints, by the way, this is the only other time that first day of the week is used in the entire New Testament. As I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do you. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Now what's most often assumed is that Paul is saying he's instituting and proving that the first century church met on the first day of the week. They met on Sunday only. Well, that's not the case. Matter of fact, it's not even implying that because the Greek here is exactly as Acts chapter 20 verse 7 where it says the first of the Sabbath. And so you can take that uh, one of two ways. Either this is again the Feast of First Fruits, which there is a Torah commandment that all the people are to take an offering and they are to bring it to Jerusalem for the Levites as an offering before Yahweh. It could absolutely be that because that's what the Torah says and you're supposed to do that in First Fruits and that's exactly what's happening here. It could be what's happening. Or number two, the other way that you can render this is literally the way we would say it in English is one of the Sabbaths. Okay, it can mean that. First does not have to mean in the Greek mindset the one before two, it can mean one of. Matter of fact, uh, if, if we, the, the literal version of this, the LITV version says this, which is a much better rendering. On one of the Sabbaths, let each of you put by himself, storing up whatever he prospered, that there not be collections when I come. And so what we see here is in one of the, the major Christian versions we have a very good, much better rendering. They're much more intellectually honest with the scriptures that it cannot mean first day of the week because the word is not week there. The word is Sabbath. The word is Shabbat or Sabbaton. Okay? Acts chapter 15, one of the most popular chapters that people bring up to say that the that, 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 that Sabbath is done away with or the law is done away with. We don't have to do this or that because we only have to do these four things. And let's read those four things. But that we write unto you that they abstain from pollution of idols, from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. Now let me ask you a question. Are we to believe that the only four things that we as, as Christian believers or Gentile believers, if you, would, if you would prefer, are to do are just these four things? That adultery doesn't matter, uh, taking the name of God in vain doesn't matter. Uh, worshiping only one God doesn't matter anymore. Uh, stealing doesn't matter. Clearly, he didn't go through the whole list, and clearly he did not mean that these are the only four things like most of us grew up believing. Now, most of us have heard of this verse. I'm going to suggest to you that many of you have never read the very next verse. So let's read the very next verse and see if in the mind of the president of the Council of Jerusalem, James that he's thinking that the Sabbath is done away with. Watch this. Verse 21 reads, For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read on the in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So what's happening? Very simply, the question is about whether or not you can be saved or not and still do these four things. James says, nope, can't be part of our fellowship if you're going to do these four things. And he says to the everybody in standing, don't, basically, don't worry about it. They will learn the rest as they go because they're in the synagogue every Saturday and every Saturday, every seventh day, every Shabbat, Moses is being read from someone in, somebody sitting in Moses' seat. See how it all meshes together? Same message, same word, same people from beginning to the end. And our last one is Galatians chapter 4, verse 9. 
It says this, but now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. Ladies and gentlemen, it is critical that we understand the context. So let's go to verse 8. It says, formerly when you did not know God. So what we're saying here, or what we are supposed to believe in Galatians chapter 4, is that the Gentiles, Paul is rebuking the Gentiles for going back to Judaism. He's rebu rebuking them for going back to the Sabbath. When the fact is right here in, in verse 8, it says that they, didn't, they never knew God. Matter of fact, it says even further than that, that they served other gods. These were pagan Gentiles. These were Gentiles that were in polytheistic uh, belief structure and in every cultic society in the first century. And still today, every cult had their own Sabbath, their own new moons, their own festivals and feast days. And he's saying, listen, you just came out of a religious a structure that totally put you in bondage through those horrible earthly man-made doctrines and principles. If you do what the circumcision party is telling you to do and you believe that you can only be saved by doing the, the things that they tell you to do and keeping the Sabbath the way that they keep, tell you to keep it, and you rely on that for your salvation, then you're going back to the same exact disgusting principles that you were in in pagan polytheistic cultism. These were Gentiles, ladies and gentlemen. They were not Jews. How can they go back to something that they never observed before? And you know, one of the biggest proofs that the, that the Sabbath is definitely still valid for today is the proof of silence. The Sabbath was the most important and staple law of the Jews. If Paul of Yeshua, or Yeshua would have been teaching against it or broke it in any way, they would have immediately been brought out into the court and charged and stoned. And while we're on this topic, I don't have a slide for this, but several times Yeshua was... Uh, uh, he was falsely accused that he actually broke the Sabbath. But every single one of those, in a more careful observation, it will, it will, you'll come to the conclusion that he was not breaking the Torah at all. He was breaking their laws, the extra laws that they had added to the Torah. He never broke his father's word. He said he kept it perfectly. And matter of fact, if he would have broken one of the Sabbath laws, he would not have qualified to be our Messiah. Because to be the Messiah, he must be sinless. There's no such recording, no such debate, because there was never such a memo that was ever given out. The Sabbath was always relevant, and it still is today. There is absolutely no evidence that the early believers did not celebrate the Sabbath. None. Matter of fact, as we're going through here, hopefully you can see there's an abounding amount of information that they kept it. And you know what? A lot of the argument comes out and says, well, he, they never said keep the Sabbath. Well, if the Sabbath is the most foundational law in all of first century Judaism, do they have to tell them to do it when everybody knows to do it? That's like saying that you've had your license for your whole life, your driver's license, uh, that we have to uh, come back, we're going to reinstitute the entire Constitution of America, and now we have to come back and tell you to stop at a red light or stop at a, site, a, a, a stop sign. It's understood because it's always been there. There's no reason to tell them to do something that is so basic and fundamental to their faith. But here's the number one proof that the Sabbath is still relevant today. Watch this in Matthew chapter 24. And of all people that says this, it's our Messiah. In verse 15, it says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back and get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For when there will be great tribulation, such as not ever been before since the beginning of time, nor ever will be. What are they talking about? He is specifically talking about the end of time. 
the great tribulation, the very beginning of the great tribulation. And J Jesus, the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach is saying, do not pray that it's not on the Sabbath. He is expecting that all of his believers will be keeping the Sabbath. If he did not expect that, he would certainly not have mentioned that pray that it's not on the Sabbath. Because if it didn't matter, then he certainly would not have said that. So the very fact that he is telling the believers at the end days, right before the Messiah comes back, to pray that it's not on the Sabbath proves without a shadow of a doubt that in the back of his mind, and I would submit in the front of his mind, he is expecting his followers to believe and keep the Sabbath. So lastly, it becomes this. We've talked about a lot of things. We've gone through all the verses. We've gone through all the arguments. It comes down to this. Most people feel in their heart of hearts that something's just not right. I mean, it's the fourth commandment. There's no scripture saying to get rid of it. If there was, it would be prophesied. For Yahweh says that nothing happens on planet Earth without a prophecy first. So if he puts it in stone, he has to prophesy. It was prophesied that the high priesthood would change. But it was never prophesied that the Sabbath would change. So most people feel that in their spirit, and they know that it's not right and that the Sabbath probably is for today. So the number one question becomes, well, how do I keep it? So let's go through a few verses, and then I'll tell you what my own personal family does. First of all, Exodus chapter 20, verse 10 says this. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it you shall not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor your daughter, your maidservant, uh, your manservant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger that is within your gates. So the very first thing that uh, we learn from the scriptures on, on what we to not do on the Sabbath is we're not supposed to work. Now, amazingly, that somehow offends people. To me, it's encouraging. I don't have to work. There's one day a week that I absolutely do not have to work, and that is on Shabbat, and it's the most looked forward to day of my week. Let's keep moving. Yahweh is our provision. You know what? Some people say I shouldn't put this slide in there because it's a little bit too strict. But watch this. It says, six days you shall labor, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Even during the plowing season and harvest you'll rest. What is this saying? This is saying that even if you're in the middle of the, 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 the greatest harvest or it's going to rain the next day, he says, obey my commandment. Remember when Yeshua is in the boat and the storm comes up? What do they do? They wake him up and they say, Yeshua, we're going to die. <laughs> they're with the son of the living God. And they think they're going to die because of a storm. And he stands up and he tells the storm to be quiet. Let me ask you something. I don't, I don't know where you are in your journey or what your fears or anxiety is. But how much do you really believe in this God that you say that you, you serve? Are you worried about finances? Are you worried about money? Are you worried about what you're going to eat the next day? Then you're not serving the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because my God, my Elohim, my Yahweh provides everything for those who love him. He provides for the birds how much more he will provide for you. And that's why he says here in Exodus that, listen, if you just honor me and do what I say, do you not think that I am the, who do you think causes the crops to grow? He says, I will take care of it. Make no excuse. You just do your part and I'll do mine. Leviticus 23.8 says this, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh seven days. And the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall do no servant work therein. Basically, in a nutshell, he's saying that this is a great time to gather. This is a holy convocation. This is a gathering of the saints together. Now, you may be in a place where you can't gather with any saints. Maybe you live in a part where, where nobody believes in keeping the Sabbath. Well, you know what? Then your family is a holy convocation. Maybe you're in a situation where you can't meet on Sunday, that your congregation uh, has to meet, or excuse me, Saturday, that you, you, it has to meet on a, on a different day of the week because for some physical limitation, you can't. Well, you do your best to meet as a holy convocation on Shabbat. That's what it's all about. It is doing your best. He asks us to be holy. Holy is doing your best to do uh, what he tells you to do through faith. That's what cleanses us and makes us holy. He expects us to fall. That's why he says in Romans 8, 1, 
there's no condemnation anymore for those who are in Yeshua. Now you can go through, do the best that you can, but when you do fall, you will not be condemned. But before Yeshua died, didn't matter if you did your best at all, when you broke the law, you were condemned. Isaiah 58, 13 says this, and I highlighted and underlined it because it's important. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and Yahweh's holy day honorable, if you honor it by not going your own way and doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord. Then you will find your joy in the Lord. You hear what I'm saying? Then, or hear what he's saying? You will find the joy in the Lord. So if you don't wake up every morning and you don't have joy from Yahweh filling your heart, then I'm going to suggest to you that your pipe is clogged because the truth can only do one thing and that sets you free. The power of God only works through two things. It works through truth and humility. So if your pipes are clogged with traditions and doctrines of men or anything else, then the joy of the Lord cannot come through. Blessings do not flow when we are in disobedience. So what is that scripture telling us? That scripture is telling us that if we take his Sabbath and we call it a delight, that we are not supposed to do whatever we want to do. This is not a day for us to be selfish, to go do what we want to do. This is a day to set apart, to spend time with him, and to love your family because there is no greater law than to love your neighbor as yourself. And your neighbor starts at home. You can't even prepare work. Because he knows our hearts. Back in Numbers 15, 32, it says, While the Israelites were in the desert, a man was found gathering wood on the Sabbath day. So uh, uh, the reason why I bring this scripture up is because we are so good as, as American Israelites, what I call American Israelites, that we'll do exactly what they do. Is On Shabbat, uh, you know, we'll start to get bored because, you know, we've read the Bible for only so many hours. And we start to prepare to work. Yahweh says, no, this is my day. You guys work all the time. You are addicted to work. You can't sit in my presence and just be still. He wants to train us to be still before the Lord. Is there anything so wrong with this? I would suggest to you that daddies need more time with their children. Husbands need more time with their wives. Let me say it in reverse. Wives need more time with you husbands. If you'll do what the Bible tells you to do, it will bless you from the top down. Next slide, no buying on the Sabbath. The people in making an oath before Yahweh said this in Nehemiah 10, 31. When the neighboring peoples bring merchandise or grain to sell on the Sabbath, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or any holy day. I have a lot of questions on this. Jim, on Shabbat, uh, can we go out to eat? Can we buy things? Well, it is very clear in Scripture, to me anyway, that we have his people making an oath before him saying we will not buy things from those that do not celebrate the Sabbath. Well, Jim, they're going to be working anyway. I mean, they're working at Burger King. I mean, whether I go through the drive-thru or not, isn't that a moot point? I mean, they're going to be working anyway. Well, here's the question. Are you being part of the solution? Or are you being part of the problem? If everyone did what you do, which is buy things on Shabbat and break the Sabbath according to the commandment, then it always continually is profaned. But if everyone stopped buying, Guess what? They would shut everything down. And I suggest that we each be part of the problem, excuse me, part of the solution, and not part of the problem. Every one of us will stand before him on one day, and we'll give an account for what we did. And we can't say, well, everybody else was doing it this way, and I didn't really see any harm in it. He knows what you do in public, and he knows what we do in secret. Bottom line is this. We're not supposed to do whatever we do the other six days of the week. We're not supposed to work. No making other people work by buying from them and making them wait on us. This is not a day to do what we want to do, but a day to delight in the Lord and our family, which are the two top things on his list. It is a day to rest from life and to get our batteries recharged by plugging into his word. You know, every single time that, that you spend time with the Father, do you know this? It's an amazing concept. He spends time with you. Every single time that you choose to sit on his lap, he will hold you. Every single time that you dig into his word, he will reveal himself to you. 
how do you think he feels when you go six days a week and you decide to stop everything and honor your wife, to honor your children, to honor him, to spend time with him, and you choose to do what's difficult in American society? which is not go out to eat, which is not buy things, which is not cause other people to work, and you do your part to turn this creation around? How do you think he feels when you go to that extent, all for in the name of honoring him? You see, it never says that the road is wide and easy. He says that it's narrow and it's hard. And right now I see nothing but people in, in Christian religious circles taking the easy way out. And I'm suggesting that it's time to do the hard thing because hard things are coming. And until we prepare, we will not be ready for the things that are ahead. And the last question that always gets brought up is, Jim, how do I know that the seventh day is still Saturday? How do I know that the seventh day isn't Monday or Wednesday or Friday? Well, very simply is this, because the Julian calendar was instituted back in around in, in 45 A.D., so just 10 or 15 years after Yeshua died, the Julian calendar was instituted. And 1,500 years later, the Gregorian calendar was instituted. And so we have the calendars that go all the way back to almost the time of Yeshua, certainly the time of his, of his disciples. And we know that the Shabbat was on the seventh day when his disciples were keeping it, and all they did was count seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, Shabbat. One, two, three, four, five, six, Shabbat. There was never a debate on which day Shabbat was on. It was always on the seventh day. As a matter of fact, the strongest evidence that Shabbat is today on Saturday is the fact that every single Jewish group in the world that believes in the seventh day Sabbath believes it's on Saturday. There's no debate. There's no groups that are keeping it on Monday that believe that in the seventh day Sabbath. So if you believe that you count it the way the Bible says, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it's always on Shabbat. The days change as far as what you call them, whether it's going to be the 16th of Nisan or, or the 14th of, of, of Tammuz or so on and so forth, but the days never change. It's very simple, and it was one of the most, and is still the mo one of the most holy laws in all of Judaism You'd think they would get that right, and they certainly have. So we can be rest assured uh, that, and we know mathematically, that Saturday is the seventh day. Special cases. I get these questions all the time, and then we'll finish up. What if I'm a doctor, or would I have to go to work, would I have to go to work or I'll lose my job? What do I do then? Well, here's what I tell people, and these are all special cases. First of all, it's very important that you know that this is not a salvific issue. Okay, you don't lose your salvation if you break the Sabbath. But you will be accountable for it on Judgment Day. There's two forms of righteousness. There's a righteousness of Yeshua that covers you in his blood that gets you into the New Jerusalem. That's your ticket in, if you will. And then there's the, your, righteous, your righteousness of all the things that you did on this earth. The book of works that are opened up. This will be one of those works that we will be judged by. So I get this question asked all the time. Well, Jim, what do I do? Listen. I'm not Yeshua. I can't tell you what to do. All I can tell you is what the scripture says. And then there is this amazing entity called the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh that was sent to instruct us, to teach us all things. This is a relationship, ladies and gentlemen. Don't make it a checkmark list. That's what the Pharisees did. So what I tell people is this. If you're forced to work, you're a doctor or, or you get called into work or you have to work right now because you, you, you can't get another job, then give the money away. Give it to charity. Give it as above and beyond of your local uh, giving and offering at your local assembly. Give it to someone that needs it. Don't keep it for yourself if you have to. That's the best answer I can come up with for that. The Sabbath was made for man, Yeshua said, not for the Jews. It was made for all mankind in the garden. It was wrote down in stone on Mount Sinai and was commanded to be kept forever. It was a sign forever between Yahweh and his people. Yeshua kept the Sabbath, as did all of his disciples. We will be commanded to keep it when he comes back. The early Gentile church fathers who hated the Jews stopped keeping the Sabbath on Saturday and started keeping it on Sunday because of their anti-Semitism. The Roman Catholic Church admits changing it, and there is nowhere in the scriptures that prophesies of such a major change of what God called eternal 
or even a debate in the New Testament or other writings. And we've come really to the very end of this teaching, and I hope that this teaching has helped you understand the most significant part of the connection between Genesis and Revelation 22 is this thread of the seventh day Sabbath, or what he calls the seal of his people. You know, one of the things that we do, uh, we've been doing this uh, from, in our family for several years now. On Friday nights, the Sabbath goes from sundown Friday night to sundown Saturday night. You do the best that you can, but to, just to give you a couple ideas, one of the things that our family does is to set it apart, we take out our fine china, we get out our crimson red uh, cloth and put it on our dining room table. We get wine glasses, even for our little ones. Uh, I have five little ones, so they all have their little bitty wine glasses. We, my oldest makes a challah bread, and we have a little communion. We read out of the scriptures. We light the candles, and I teach them that the candles represent light and how the light is transferred to us, and we're the light of the world. There's about a million and a half things that you can teach them just through the candles and light and the scriptures and the food that's being prepared. I pray over my wife. I pray over my children. The children bless one another, and I can't believe that I've been missing this my whole life. I can't believe that people call this bondage. It has revolutionized my family. And if you do not celebrate the Sabbath, try it for one month. It will change your life. I promise you. Is it easy? No. We're all conditioned to do things the way we've always been doing them. But as you begin to get used to it, my kids on Tuesday always ask me, Monday on Tuesday, Daddy, when is the Sabbath? When is Shabbat? And by Friday, they're singing songs about the Sabbath. They can't wait. Why? Because it's Daddy time. They know they're going to get me. My wife knows she's going to get me. And then on Saturday, I spend some time teaching them. Fathers should be teaching their children. This is the day set apart to do that. This is my personal time that we get with the Lord. We go to a park. We'll get together with some other people. We'll invite them over for dinner. Just throwing out some ideas. The bottom line is set it apart for His glory. Yes, every day you can worship Him. Every day you can glorify Him. But there is one day a week that He says that is His and set apart for nothing else but Himself. And that is the Sabbath, Shabbat, on the seventh day. Thanks for joining us here at Passion for Truth Ministries. I'm Jim Staley. May God bless you and keep you. May Yahweh let his face shine upon you.